Lee? Uh, we did it differently, Sandia. So we didn't, people didn't sign up. It's just to come if you're available. I think Elaine oh, is hoping to join. Okay. All right. Fine. So um, I think it's fine to start anyway with two minutes past. So thank you for joining us. Um, I really like the way the round table has taken shape over the last year or so. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and as you know, this sort of recording is shared with our members and other employers in the community. Um, so yeah, just if anybody's got any questions, uh, I definitely have one, but I'll save that for the end. If anybody's got any questions, do please ask. Who wants to go first? Mike, you look like you're thinking about something. No, I was trying to think of, a, I've been trying to think of something sort of really fascinating to ask before I came on and I've utterly failed. <laughs> Is it all right if I will? I, I, sorry, go ahead. No, you, yeah, yeah. I've got go a ahead, general Mercy. question. Go ahead. I've got a general question. It's, um, does anyone have any sort of insights they want to share about where we are and the next year? since we're moving into December now. Sorry, can you say that again, Genevieve? Yes, um, does anyone have any insights about the new year? In terms of case law or in terms of ruling? Yeah, I mean about issues that you think were important uh, at the moment and that could be important in the new year. Right. I have to say my, my um, it's interesting you say that. I, I'm, I, I feel like part of, part of me is sort of sitting waiting to hear whether or not the government are going to progress the um, uh, the the, cha the 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 post Brexit legislative changes that were originally I can't remember what it was called. The, um, the we're going to sweep away everything related to Europe clause uh, law, uh, and then I that seems from what I've heard that seems to have been slowed down or shelved but I, I I think everyone I hear writing about it says that if they're going to try and go through it line by line it will never get done by the deadline and if they do it if they just sweep everything away then it's going to be left with chaos and I'm not convinced the new government is quite as into chaos as previous ones may have been but I'd be interested in other people's views but I think to me that's one of the biggest things that we're waiting on I don't know what other people think Okay, I have read, of course, um, that data protection that they seem to be keen to bring in um, in relation to, you know, the formula the GDPR. They're very keen to have our own UK new legislation. So I'm just wondering if you have an opinion about that or how that's going to take shape. I, I mean, again, I. I, I'm, I'm curious what other people think, but I, I'm, I, I'm not getting the impression that the current government is really tempted to go in with wide scale, with a sledgehammer going in, what, you know, knocking everything down. They seem to be more incremental in their style, but, you know, that's not through any direct knowledge. That's just the impression I get, but I'd be curious what other people think. I think I'd say on that, I think it's just a huge task within the deadline they set themselves. I know that there are calls by other parties for at least the time frame to be extended just to give give some time to actually review this. Obviously, we're talking about years worth of legislation um, that, that will just be wiped out. Um, at the end of next year unless they then legislate to keep it and I think that it's such a huge task to complete within the time frame they've given themselves I, I just don't know how they would I, I think like you just said Mike to, it's going to take so much time to go through how together with everything else that's going on they think that they're, they're ever going to complete that within the time frame I, I, I would suspect the time frame will be extended. I suspect that we've got kind of the end of next year at the moment, but that we will see that extended um, before we see any kind of real changes. Or I'm sure there'll be an indication as, what they're, as to what they're looking to do, but I think that that time frame will be extended. I think it'll have to be. My, um, my understanding from the talks that I've been to um, <laughs> is that the 
in terms of the legislation that came from the EU, it's, it is limited in certain ways as to what came from Europe and what was, or from the EU, I should say, and what is our own legislation. But actually the process of separating those two is probably a job in itself. And I think that, um, you know, the things like that, that might the some of the key things that might be affected would be things like the cheapy regulations and obviously GDPR um and the agency workers um and those types of things um rather than the fundamentals of our employment law system Chris can obviously correct me if I'm completely off there because I'm not a lawyer um and I'm not as up to date as probably he is but um that was that's the kind of that's what I've taken away. And I think the realistic view is that they're not going to tear it all up or allow it to all just disintegrate. But, and I guess what they might do is just incorporate it into UK law and then do what they want to do with it for over a period of time if it's not fundamental. Because they must know how massive that mountain is. They're not, uh, you know, they're not complete idiots. <laughs> um, so I don't know what others think, Chris, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'd agree with what you both said. Um, uh, obviously, the legislation is fundamentally enshrined in, in UK law. So so we are the influence and, and the direct effect um, and purposive interpretations all derive from the European uh, vein. But I think in, in terms of our own legislative structure, we are where we are, and I cannot see anybody looking to dismantle that and go at it like a bull in a china shop. I mean, it, it, it's, I would have thought years of work if if they were going to literally carve it up, compartmentalize it, separate it out and sort of, you know, uh, delete aspects. I would have thought the easiest thing, frankly, is just to leave it in place and give it a, a, a UK slant. Um, because the purpose of interpretation derives from from sort of EU law um, and, and case law uh, uh, has, has an influence on the statutory interpretation anyway. Um, and that increasingly will be from from the uh, parliamentary sovereignty rather than the sort of European base. So I, I, I would imagine steady as you go probably is, is what they're thinking rather than let's do what we say and dismantle. you know I, I i just i i i agree with totally what what you said I, you know there, there's just simply not the time mm. um in, in terms of sort of other influences and other factors i would have thought uh the country seems to be talking itself up into recession and and where that's going and um clearly that will have an impact on on property and transactions where they're based on on confidence market confidence um uh and and certainly from the employment sphere i'm i'm already seeing an upturn in um companies looking for advice or, on efficiencies uh uh but often what we're talking about is redundancies uh you, know, you can call it headcounts you can call it embarrassings but but actually what they're looking to do is is slim down um and, or and or redistribute aspects so i suspect that that curve is going to uh become more stark um mike i don't know if you've seen more and and, and Roz, if you've seen more lisa if if if, if that's your 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 view too yeah mike you're on uh, sorry um most 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 of my clients are financial sector and they they don't seem to have taken a big hit on it on on it at the moment, but I'm seeing them being a little more um, cautious in terms of their uh, they their hiring. Um, but but they're not. I don't think we're looking at swinging cuts in that sector. Um, professional services. I'm seeing some trimming, software. All the I mean, most of my clients are newer clients. They're all going great guns. So most of them is binary. You're either growing or you're closing there's not much in between uh, in that sector i've seen um but anecdotally from people in other sectors yeah i think it's it's all looking fairly grim i think to go back so just your comment on the um 
the, the general political thing. I can't see. I can't see that the, the expenditure of political capital on things like doing away with or, or resolving two P is, is is how the government are going to want to spend their opportunities. I'd have thought it would have been on quick wins, more simple things. But I think stuff like Tupi, I, I personally cannot see any any government department wanting to spend a ton of time or select committee wanting to spend a ton of time on resolving stuff like Tupi because it's so it's so complex. Whereas I think things like um, having certain rights, whether or not they're going to move to day one rights, um, stuff like flexible working, which to me is a bit rearranging the deck chairs um, based on what we've currently got. But I just, I, I personally can't, I don't think the government's got that much political capital and I can't see they're going to expend it on employment law. But I have been wrong in the past and look forward to be wrong again very soon. I don't know what I, we should get. Uh, don't we should, forget we've got trade unions banging on the table all the time asking for change. So even if they don't have the money, I think the unions aren't going to be backing off anytime soon. Sure, but that's yeah. that's 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 their job, and that you know that's never going to change. Um, but I'm from yeah. a government, government perspective, I I would have thought also that they're they're going to play a, a view that our trade union is going to fall out of favour publicly if the strikes if more strikes start to extend. I don't know. Maybe we need to get Laura Trot on and ask her. I don't think they were ever too much in the favour of the public for yeah. <laughs> fear of incurring their wrath. That's the truth. Yeah. I mean, with these many strikes, I don't think anybody would be too happy with that, would they? No. So, I mean, I think there might be elements of sympathy with some sectors, but I don't yeah. know. Wait and see. Mm. Interesting. Um, does that answer your question, Genevieve? I know it's. it's oh, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. What's your thought, Genevieve? Yeah, okay. Well, um, it's. Uh, I was just thinking last weekend, I actually, since you were talking about the trade unions, uh, last weekend I actually went to Harrods, but that was mainly because I was sort of had a bit of a Christmas spirit. So I went, of course, to have a look at the Christmas decorations. But actually, Unite was standing outside and actually picketing and had a loudspeaker and protesting that all the employees of Harrods should have a pay rise. So I just thought, you know, I hadn't actually seen that before, just people standing on the street asking, the, you know, campaigning for a pay rise. So, you know, generally at the moment, I feel like, you know, in lots of sectors, people are dissatisfied and they're, they're showing it. I think there's also a case that it might have a bit of a snowball effect. So if yeah. the unions are successful in their endeavours on behalf of their members, then more people are likely to join the unions in other you know across the board and therefore when it comes to things like you know is everybody able to hear Ros all right yeah, or I couldn't hear the last bit. yeah sorry Ros yeah Ros, I think you dropped off towards the end your yeah, no, no, my headphones zoom doesn't like headphones can I make a formal request that we use teams um <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so it, it could be that you know when it comes to kind of the recognition process for unions within businesses that um they're more successful and it it will over a period of time change the face of employee relations moving forward and it become much more uniony like it used to be back in the day before employee rights were enhanced so uh, that's my uh concern i suppose that you know the the good employers will um, find that whatever they do is is kind of um, overshadowed by the desire for people to kind of join unions and use that method of getting better rights and all the rest of it rather than having meaningful conversations with management mm -hmm. for an empl employee representative body of some kind, but an internal one that's a bit more you know that the in my experience those have tended to sort of balance the business the representatives have tended to balance the business needs versus the employee needs whereas obviously unions don't really particularly take that approach yeah the only thing, other thing that kind of springs to mind because it's coming up fairly soon and of course it's had a lot of publicity on the news is of course the nurses in the nhs and the fact that they of course have already set a date for the strike so I'm kind of interested to see if the government moves and does something to prevent that. 
you mean something to do with the trade union regulations in terms of what they can well, no, do? I, well, right I think what I'm what I meant was actually, I suppose, come in with an offer and stop it. Okay. Yeah. I have to say, Ros, Ros, I have to say, I think I, I do, I disagree with your view. I think unless we get to a specific tipping point, which I think will often hang on one particular sector and one particular claim, I, I, I think whilst there is a small uptick in union membership, I think everything I read and hear about unions is that they are significantly more effective at at the sort of local and regional level in terms of not just working on pay but working on a variety of campaigns a lot of which are frankly quite sent you know are very sensible and it's a, it's as much mm. around um access to work and um uh, supporting employees but i think yeah i'm, I'm not sure i'd I'm not sure I'd... it was just an observation of what might happen if the unions succeed in what they're trying to do i suppose and everybody and they eventually the powers that be roll over and say oh okay here's your 25 percent pay rise whatever i don't think that's likely to happen but if there is any ground gains it may over a period of time lead to something um i'm not saying yeah. that's what's going to happen i just think that it, it, it will be interesting to see what happens because it will will all depend on how these things are dealt with right now and it may have a, an effect on that in a longer term. I agree. Oh, I would, I would imagine that, sorry, Mike, um, uh, I, I would imagine without sort of politicising uh, the, the forum, but, but we can just uh, well imagine that there are a number of factors which would militate towards an increased union membership, because if you just stand back and look at the economy, people join unions because they want union protection um, and that representation both at local and, and national level um, if if there's perception that the union clout is is uh, more successful than they would otherwise uh, achieve in terms of um, job uh, uh, stability and package you know salary improvements um i would imagine it would be you're, you're absolutely right ros i would i would have thought insofar as that goes you're likely to see a drift into more union uh membership um because i would have thought that's simply uh the corollary of of of, of a negative um recessionary sort of impact in terms of the wider economy um yeah in dale um did a, a very interesting long interview with francis barber the uh, current TUC president, and a lot uh, came out on his uh, All Talk podcast about a week ago or two weeks ago, and and in that she's talk she is talking about the sort of the high level um, core stuff around pay, but it, a lot of it is also around wider peripheral issues, and I, I think I think the collaborative approach that the TUC are taking seem in, in my opinion seems to be paying a lot more dividends than a lot of the strike stuff, but. Um, I guess maybe that's a, a broad, a different thing. It was an interesting interview. Mm. Always an interesting one. You start talking about trade unions in the HR and employment law sector, isn't it? <laughs> um, we've got Ros, Sonia Ros, and Kay. Ros, yes, Ros, 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 do you think your bandwidth is low because you've got GCHQ listening in? They think you're being subversive. Maybe. <laughs> possible i don't know every time i go into zoom every time i go into zoom it's okay for a bit with the headphones and then suddenly it just says muted no. for no apparent reason and chucks me out i don't know why no, definitely listening into you ros mm, yeah that's right yes <laughs> just to get an insight into how everybody you know what sort of reactions are you getting on the Hartpool versus brazil trust ruling uh, has anybody worked on that since the ruling helped any institution um which employs a number of variable pay work you know sort of term time only or variable pay any sort of feedback you're getting on that anyone i have a um a client that has quite a number of zero hours workers and when i talk to them about the um, implications they just kind of went 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it is, yeah. you know, the way that they have been doing the accrued holiday is, you know, to everybody's mind, fair and equal. Most of the people that do the work don't actually think that they're entitled to holiday anyway. So barely take any as it is. Yeah. Um, and so, and it's a, it's a billable model. It's like an agency model where they bill for the work that they're doing to clients and all the rest of it. So, and they have to plan in what holiday pay is going to look like, what that, how much that's going to look like. And so um, from a financial planning, they just, um, they don't, they just don't, they don't know what to do it just makes it so much more complex yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, from every perspective so they haven't done anything so we're just carrying on as we were because it's just impossible to to do it any other way and i you know i kind of said this is what you should be doing um, um uh, and the other option is to do nothing until it gets raised as an issue by somebody and they said they've gone for the latter of those because it's just impo it's just it's too difficult. There is a sense of despair, I have to say, um, amongst many, and this is why I put the question out here, because I think between all of us, we deal with different sort of sizes of businesses and sectors. Um, but specifically within the small, you know, small business sector, charities who also employ zero hours and schools who, which employ term time only workers, we are finding that schools are at least able to get the help they need to kind of recalculate and work out any back pay and sort that out. Um, but for the smaller businesses, we are finding that it is just too big and too onerous a matter to deal with administratively. It is not only taking up a lot of their time, but it's also going to cost them a lot to put this, to implement this ruling. Um, mm -hmm because it's not a one-off, it's got to be an ongoing thing that somebody's got to sit there and monitor and figure out month after month or pay reference period to pay reference period. And so the time, the cost. Yeah, yeah sure. cool. Thank you. Kate, I think we're getting some feedback there. If you don't mind putting yourself on mute, please. So yeah, it's it's we are getting pushback, a lot of pushback from the smaller businesses in terms of one, the understanding of the matter, but two, in terms of how they're going to roll with it going forward. And the danger, like you say, Rose, is for people to just go, I'm not going to do anything until I get a claim, which becomes really, it's almost sort of going against the, the whole rationale mm -hmm. of a ruling. And so Chris, and actually to the lawyers, I mean, to all the you know, employment lawyers on this, on this panel, it will be good to understand, do you think that given how impractical, for want of a better word, the Harper versus Brazil test, you know, sort of ruling is proving to be, um, do you, in your experience, do you foresee this kind of coming back to the tribunal sometime in the future for it to be appealed, or, you know, sort of, or, or I don't know, challenged or for a, for a further ruling? How, how do you think these sort of things? My question is, does general public feedback, you know, and the challenges faced by the by businesses following a ruling impact any future rulings at all in, in tribunals? Um, I suspect the answer is they can do, um, but I don't think the tribunals will be overly influenced by societal changes or um, uh, em employment federations um i mean they're they're, they're tasked with um implementing uh the law and simply they'll apply the law and i think they'll point at the legislation and say you know mm -hmm. <laughs> if you, yeah, so you want to change it there's a democratic process and and that's mm -hmm. uh, a matter for parliamentary sovereignty so I, I i i don't i don't think you'll get a softening or a dilution of that in terms of uh uh the legalities um and certainly i think at grassroots level where you see the difficulties and and i understand exactly what ross has said in terms of 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 that not not pushback from employers but it's inertia because 
they're, they're, they're sort of thinking, well, we're damned if we do, damned if we don't, but it's working. Yeah. And in, in, in the, the practical reality is, if it just continues unabated, well, okay, they've parked an issue. It's very ostrich-like. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's not dealing with the, the matter and resolving it. On the other hand, it's perpetuating something which is, in practical terms, working. And so it's exactly. easier uh, to, to allow mm. that just to continue forward. Um, I think where I've seen a couple of issues are, are at the sharp end when you get to a dismissal situation or where you look at efficiencies then sort of heading into, a say, a redundancy situation. And whoever is the target of that or performance management, I, I guess, wherever you're looking at that, somebody pops up and says, oh, by the way, I've got this whole raft mm. of, of of protection. And if I start raising this and I'm asserting a statutory right, where does that put you? Because then it will be an automatic unfair display. And, and so you, you end up with a, a, a the pull through. The worst the, yeah, is, 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 is much greater. The damage happens down the road, not, not, mm. not now, but, but it, there's a, 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 a practicality in not trying to address it because of the administrative burden, the, the costs, you know, they're, they're quite considerable. Um, but I think mm. the downside is, 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 is when the relationship fractures. Um, Very difficult one, actually. And yeah, it's totally understandable. And when you try explaining this to employers, they see it, they, they see, but they, they, they almost feel like they're caught between the rock and the hard place. On the one hand, they want to conform, and on the other hand, there is this risk that you've just pointed out uh, of falling foul of the law. Um, so it's a really difficult one. It's proving to be quite difficult for some employers. Mm -hmm. I think there's also the, the practical issue of the fact that it just it's talking about holiday in terms of weeks. And there's been no kind of effort to, you know, di dissect that into something that's a bit more that's practical, practical and would be helpful for employers in terms of interpreting the outcome of that of that case into practical ways of dealing with it it's kind of like this is the outcome off you go and you know it, it that and that in part is probably you know feeding into the fact that employers just don't really know what to do <laughs> and how to do it and the best way to do it and the only way they can see it that they have to do it is through some ridiculously overburdensome administrative process that's going to, you know, you could create a job just to deal with that if you employ enough exactly. zero hours work. I wonder, that's what I, a lot I of wonder, them do. I wonder yeah, whether you will get want. more of that guidance. As um, Chris said at the point, actually, it does become an issue and somebody is raising a um, raising yeah, concerns so around it, it. yeah whether actually then it's going yeah. again going to be via the kind of the case law that they get some guidance which itself will take time mm. Sandhya what's the general approach that the HR department is saying we are obviously so before the Harper versus Brazil Trust ruling came about our our legal team said look I think the ruling is it, they, which kind of took a punt and we said, I think the ruling is going to be more in favor of this app, you know, the um, the applicant. So we started implementing the weekly calculations within or rather stating only 5.6 weeks, for example, within contracts. And we moved away from stating any days at all within contracts. So we were already receiving pushback even before the ruling. But since the ruling has come about, uh, it has only further reinforced that message that we are having to pass on to our clients. That doesn't mean to say it's made our job any easier. Um, we, we are implementing that across the board with all clients, but ultimately, yes, the, we are putting the ball in the client's court to say, this is the law, this is the advice. We are happy to work out on these spreadsheets and assist you with it, um, provide you with the admin support to run with it, you know, month after month. So all the support is there, but that's not going to come without a cost. And that's where it's hitting them hard. You know, we are offering the support and the advice, the ongoing support as well. <clears throat> but I don't think anybody is very pleased about, or rather the schools are fine. Charities are kind of on the, you know, they sit on the fence, but it's the smaller business owners who employ about 20 or less. 
uh, who are saying, I don't want to do this. I can't afford it, especially in this time where all my costs are going up just because of this ruling. It's very similar to what Ross said earlier. They're saying, well, I'll deal with it when I, if and when I hit a problem. So the, the simple answer is we were prepared for this before the ruling and we had already started to implement it, but it has not been an easier ride just because of the ruling, let's say. The ruling hasn't changed or made our job any easier of trying to convince employers of what should be done and even offering the support and hand-holding. Don't you think a lot of employers, as you said, a lot of employers will just think, what's the worst that can happen? If I get a claim, then I'll settle it at that point because are they likely to have to pay significantly over and above what you know what the calculation is if they were to do the calculation now and make a payment what's the additional cost they would have to have if they're so for example payment? for example for a charity this was just around the time the hospital was the result ruling came about and i was working on this exact same project but they were employing term time only workers or staff and we we applied the, the ruling, you know, how it should be calculated. And there was a total figure across the board for about 12 grand of back pay for all of the employees put together. And you're looking at only about 25 staff. But um, because of this, the continuous period of un underpayment having, you know, gone on for the last three years, it was, it was just the back pay that worked out about 12 grand. So it really depends, I guess, if you if you apply the wrong calculate or not the wrong, but the current calculations that people prefer to apply and not apply what's said under her versus as a rule of ruling, the back pay kind of you know just keeps ticking on month after month after month until somebody picks up and says actually you owe me this much. So to put things in perspective, for us for a headcount of about twenty five or under, we were looking at about twelve grand, which for a charity was a big hit on their cash flow. In one shot. I think it's worse as well with the people who maybe work for short intense periods under zero hours contracts um, because they have more weeks of not working which then just kind of over inflates as it were their their holiday pay that they would be due if they wanted to take their 5.6 weeks. The clients that I tend to work with they, they tend to have people working all the time so there isn't a week where there isn't any work really um you know and, and i think if if i'm talking to clients and they've got this situation and i think my advice to them would be do it on a fixed term contract for a certain number of hours but with extra hours that might be added as a um you know as overtime or whatever for a set period because then you know if you've got set hours and um you pro rata the holiday accordingly during the period of fixed term contract then it kind of takes that danger out of it as it were, rather than having them on a perpetual kind of zero hours contract where they work like in term time or during exam period, if you're an invigilator, and I've heard that's coming up quite a lot, you've got exam invigilators who work intensively during sort of May, June time, and then hardly at all during the rest of the year. And so they're kind of, you know, that could potentially be done under a, a fixed term contract rather than a zero hours contract. So I think it's I, I work, we, working with clients to work out what the best solution is the zero hours contract, to my mind, is, is not always the best solution now, I think. Can, can I ask a general question of everyone? And, and again, I, I, I don't have any clients who have zero hours contracts, so I have to admit I haven't spent a ton of time focusing on this. Where a client, where a company has done the 12.07% approach and always just paid a roll up, is, is the opinion that on the whole they are less likely to be at risk because they've always been making a payment? And so it's less of a risk, or is this, is the risk still there because the calculation was too crude? I don't have any clients that wrap up and make a payment. So the way that my clients we do it is we have a monthly review and we review the hours that every zero hours worker has done, um, and calculate a percentage of holiday accrual. We use it's, the company uses Breeze. So they start from a zero and then we do a monthly review and then we, we calculate what 12.07% is of the hours that they have worked, round it up to the nearest half hour or quarter hour, whatever, and then add it into brief as their holiday entitlement. And then they're advised to request their holiday through Breathe and take holiday 
and log it on their time logging system as well so that they get paid holiday when they're actually you know taking holiday rather than just paying them extra over a period of time because I know the wrapping up thing was an issue yes I mean roll, roll, rolling up is is sort of deeply frowned upon nowadays in the sense it's, it's sort of generally thought of uh, as being unlawful I think it's much more arguable if you can go back to a point where there's been a, a collaborative approach and understanding and that it's clearly itemized in somebody's payslip where you can actually show you are doing it and and that separation um at least gives a a defense where you can show well you know it is being done but I, th I think generally the, the the route of march is is not to roll it up it causes a lot of difficulties because it just gets lost then in the midst of time and and actually it just becomes basic salary and it mm. just gets sort of you know and it's and basic salary is a sort of a blunt instrument in a sense because the reason it's difficult is is partly because of the eu background to this which is holiday pay everybody has a right to paid holiday and it derives from a health and safety directive, not an employment directive, I believe. Uh, I'm stretching a little bit, but um, I think that's the background to it because it was always designed as a health and safety point because um, people who, who whose time is, uh, their working time and their pay time is limited, don't take holiday. Because they don't take holiday, that they needed to be given that statutory right and they need to be given that paid right because otherwise they simply just don't take it. So that I think is is how it was sort of enshrined and how why we, we've got this problem because um, good employers who have been paying it and as they see it being wrapping it up are now being penalised and treating exactly the same way as as employers who who are uh, less uh, less generous or, or you know less um, or collaborative in their approach and pay the bare minimum. Um, both sides get sort of hit equally in, in that sense. Um, and as I say, my my experience has been, it just continues to roll forward until there's a problem. And it's when the employer seeks to do something um, that, that it, that's when it comes to light. And that's when it's sort of flung around and sort of, you know, flares up basically. Chris, if there was a claim, if someone made a claim for back holiday pay, do you think they, if 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 the employee was awarded an award for back or for, for previous holiday pay, do you think that anything that would have been paid through a rolled up payment, if it had been itemised, would be set off against that, or do you think that would be ignored, or do you think it could go either way? Um. <clears throat> It's a very good question. Um, I think it should at least be set off. I mean, my view would be it should be set off. And I think actually, if you can show genuinely that you have been paying it, there's still a defense that you can put forward and advance. Mm. Um, but it, as I say, it is deeply frowned upon nowadays. Um, but the logistics are such and it, the practicality is if you can actually show you have been paying it properly calculating it and paying it i can't see there's a loss in the first instance to merit mm -hmm. the case and i think if you were to take yeah. a, a somewhat um 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 not necessarily aggressive but but forceful approach you could actually apply to strike the claim out on a basis that has no merit no uh, likelihood of no, no reasonable prospects of 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 been successful because the underlying liability has been met um, but that's not to say that the claim actually wouldn't have any legs and couldn't be made um, but, but I, I certainly you've, you've got a much stronger case mm. both to defend and to advance some 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 uh, some arguments on that if you can show that the the genesis is that it was agreed and it has been paid it's it's where it just become emerges and over a period of time and then of course you go through a couple of years and perhaps more and it's just treated as basic salary and it drops drops off the the pay slip uh, and there's no separate calculation and that's where i think the, the mm. difficulties are even though the, the background was such it was supposed to be 
yeah. essentially there was a pay rise given at one point which pushed up the the hourly rate or whatever it might be the weekly rate mm. um just to add to what chris said mike in that example that i quoted where i watched this you know this particular charity you know what they were doing um they had this they had they had arrived at some figure of 10.8 percent um it escapes me now how they arrived at that calculation, but at the time I worked it out, but it was basically not even 12.07%. Um, but what we did in that situation when, when we were recalculating it, obviously back pay was up to a maximum of two years from the time of the last underpayment, but we just worked out what the difference was um, and said, this is, this is, some of them had been over, most of them had been underpaid, but some had been overpaid under that calculation. Um, because there are the change, et cetera. But, but the, the, the point is we just worked out what the difference was and paid the back pay. Um, and if it was to be challenged, we could at least show that going forward from the time that error was discovered, we kind of put the right kind of calculation in place for them. Who knows how a tribunal would rule in that situation. But I think we did consider what was already paid under the, under the incorrect calculation and just paid the difference. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I don't know how a tribunal would, would sort of look at that because it hasn't been challenged. <laughs> I think they're out of time to challenge that now since it's been set right. So never know. <laughs> it's a really tricky one, but we are continuing to receive a lot of pushback in general. Nobody likes the sound of it. Any other questions at all? Um, I have a question. It's just something that's come up this morning, actually. And I um, I caveat this with, I know that um, when it comes to companions, you should, if, unless you've got a really good reason to say no, you should just allow it because it just makes life easier and it makes you look like you're a reasonable employer. But um, an employee has chosen to attend with her husband, so that's fine. We've said, kind of said, all right, it's not, he used to be an employee, he's not now. Um, and we've said he can attend as a supporting member. But the employee in question who's doing a grievance appeal, she has said, she's also mentioned the fact that he is a union member, uh, a member of a union for a university and colleges, so the UCU. Um, she doesn't work for a university or college. So um we are of the view that he can only attend as a supporting family member and not actually be recognized as a as a relevant trade union rep because he doesn't represent the category of worker that that she is because she works for a tourist operation and destination in the leisure industry she does not work at university and college i'd just be interested to understand um what do you reckon about that, Chris? <laughs> um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, mm. I mean, the statutory right is to be um, the companion is is a work colleague or a union representative, a union official. And mm. I think that I, I, I would perceive that. I mean, I don't know the contrary to be the case, but I would certainly perceive that to be the representative capacity can only be if you're a member of that recognized union because yeah. otherwise it's just a union officer full stop and i don't think that's right it's representative yeah. it's not uh, his role his, it's not his role as a union rep to represent a worker of her type yes doing it outside of that role because he should be representing lecturers and college yes. staff etc yes so, so so i get that I, mm -hmm. I i suspect the reality is in practical terms it makes very little difference because anybody can represent somebody and say, oh, you know, please direct any correspondence to me and so forth. And while an employer can always say, well, you know, thank you, I'm not going to do that, or I'm going to do that because mm. while, while we're engaging with our employee, you can be as sort of amenable or not um, or, or, on that. Um, and 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 uh, she can share any information. And of course, being a husband wife team, it's likely she's going to. Um, but it makes no difference if if I suspect if you allow her to be accompanied her companion can raise issues can even mm. possibly make 
submissions, but he can't give evidence on her behalf and he can't answer questions on her behalf yeah in what, whichever guys so yeah. i suspect mm. the reality is that you know you you you're probably doing exactly what i would suggest in the sense that you can't be criticized you're showing the the, the process is is being adapted mm. um and and used reasonably but you're you're drawing a line about the artificiality of it um mm. yeah i would be doing yeah. exactly the same thing i think Mm, okay, that's good. I have to say, I, I, I'm not sure I would agree, Chris. I think all of the readings I've had of any guidance on it is that as long as they are either a trade union official or a trade union person that has been certified to uh, take, you know, to act as a representative in these matters, I don't think they have to, the individual doesn't have to be a member of that union. And I don't think the union has to be recognised by the employer or even be related to the industry. I, I think. No, I, I totally agree with you news. on that. I, I totally agree with you on that. I suppose my <clears throat> my 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 view is it is not part of his job as a union rep for university and college to represent someone that works in the tourist industry. Doesn't doesn't that's matter. That's not part of his job to represent. But that that's an issue for his union. Her. If if she was just the Joe Bloggs off the street. And said oh i need a companion and someone said oh joe's a companion because he, he can be a companion because he's a he's a union rep for the um nuj you know is there an understanding that the it, it, he's not i don't know a union rep paid i don't know but he's not Come that on. role that he has as a, as a union rep for the ucu doesn't that, include representing issue, workers issue. within her Sorry. Uh, within that business because there are no workers of that description or category working for that employer so he can't do it as part of his job as a union that's an, that's an, issue. That's an issue for his union mm. that's an issue for his union it's not an issue for the employer because as long as they I mean I think the ACAS guidance just seems to indicate you only have to be a an accredited trade union person it doesn't matter which sector you're in i don't think I, I suppose that makes sense mike it, it, um if 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 the point is it's either a work colleague so it's you know somebody who's familiar with the forum uh, the employment relations in the forum in which you work or alternatively it's somebody with a wider representative guys uh, from a union background i suppose that makes absolute sense that uh you know it's it's somebody where it may be embarrassing or simply not practicable to to have somebody from from the from work you you can reach out and get somebody else in um but i don't as i said i don't i think it would be a very bold move to say no um yeah. uh, and, and i think that would that would always be a, a risky thing to do so i suspect the answer is to leave the door open welcome somebody in but make it quite clear in what capacity they're they're mm. participating anyway so you whichever route you, you 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 sort of you journey you get to the same destination and mm. and and you know you 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 make those points quite emphatically and mm. you conduct the meeting on that basis so i suspect uh that their sort of representative capacity is 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 possibly less important than simply their their the statutory right for the employee to be uh, uh have a companion Mm, I suppose the key point is that they know they, if they are a union rep of any nature, then they know what the what their purpose is and what their role is, and they have had the appropriate training to act as such. So it's the right kind of representative, I suppose. Roz, have we asked the question as to why, you know, was any effort made at all to identify an alternate representative rather than somebody's husband? Um, yes, I know we allow family members, you know, of yes. of individuals uh, to accompany them, and we did that quite a bit during during COVID. Um, but really, that should be a last resort, in my view. Um, mm. I think if that's not the only trade union rep in the whole town. I mean, did you make any efforts at all to go and find another trade tra trade union representative? or a companion who is not a family member? I would be asking mm -hmm. that question before I said yes to this. No, I just asked, was, was, did, 
did he attend as a as husband during the initial grievance and the fact that he's a trade union rep else uh, the fact that he's a trade union official elsewhere has only come out at this stage or was that known from the outset no he didn't attend the first one okay. she had a colleague with her who i think has either resigned or left already um so um i don't think that she has I think she just wants to bring her husband and that's it and she thinks that she's got more grounds for doing it if she says he's a union rep that's my feeling because she's quite ambitious <laughs> I wouldn't agree I would, I would encourage her and help her to find an person who's not a I, I don't think that's going to work Sandia <laughs> it's not it's not in a good place the relationship I think if we tried to tell her what companion she should have it's not going to work well I think we should just, uh, you know, I think we're just going to agree it um, and sort of label her as a support, as him as a supporting family member and just see. It's the same thing, isn't it, really? You know, the role is the same. Well, we always be these pretty ones, aren't we? <laughs> no, it never ending. <laughs> I think, I think if... If if you're in, in a forum, particularly with somebody with statutory unfair dismissal rights, potentially, um, you're always better giving on the soft points, which you don't need to have a confrontation. You don't need to have an argument. You're uh, from an employer's point of view, you're 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 ticking boxes in terms of being reactive and and approaching things uh, with an open mind and being you know collaborative in that sense um it's much better than artificially drawing up a fight which you don't need to have on an issue which is quite peripheral to actually the the, the subject matter of the meeting um and on that the, the companion can have a view and they can express it but they're not entitled to answer any questions or give evidence um you know, unless they're called in a, in a slightly different capacity as, as a witness of fact. So I, you, most employers, I suspect, would do what you're doing, which is, OK, let, let's soften that. We don't need that to be difficult. We don't need any arguments that we've fallen foul of the ACAS code or anything like it. Actually, that's a path, path of least resistance. And also we're showing we're being reasonable. So we can't be criticised, but it's not actually going to affect the conduct of the meeting because that's in the, the employer's hands isn't it so mm. interesting we've got five minutes left um anyone got any other questions at all any well, comments yeah, I'm, so I'm not going to get this up tomorrow i'll just try to push up as far as i can so if you want it as soon as possible i think we're still yeah, getting yeah, feedback yeah. <laughs> fine <laughs> There you go. Thank you, Gage. Thanks a lot. That was sounds like GCSQ was trying to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Interestingly, when we sit down for meetings um, with sort of, you know, the local community businesses, um, very often staff don't have any representation or don't or haven't joined a trade union. And very rarely do I come across somebody who's joined a trade union or who is a member, at least in the business that I'm working with. Um, which I don't know whether it's a good or a bad thing, um, but yeah, and, and yeah, we do get this request of you know, companions being friends or family member quite a bit because they, because they don't want to ask a colleague and they don't want and they're not members of a trade union. We see that, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else at all? Sound yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I know I sort of slightly alluded to it earlier, but it would be, I don't know if through the chamber, we were able to try and get uh, Laura Trott on uh, to a future one, uh, not specifically to sort of ask her about details on HR issue or employment law issues, but as a sort of a more general thing, or do we already do that and we want to save that for a wider forum? I think that generally tends to happen in the spring or summer session, isn't it, Catherine? Um, um, maybe your would be helpful. Yeah, I can ask. Um, 
you know, Fridays is her day in her constituency. So it's very probable, possible if we had it on a Friday that she might be able to join us for 10 minutes. Um, I've got a re relatively good relationship with Graham Clack, her um, personal secretary. So, and she does owe us a few favors because she keeps agreeing to come to things. And then because she's in the house for various reasons has had to pull out. Um, so um, I'll ask and see what she has to say. I think especially as she's now an Under Secretary of State at the Department of Work and Pensions. Yes, she is indeed. That's especially relevant. A minister. Yeah. Cool, I'll ask. Thank you very much. That'll be interesting. Thank you for that. One, one thing um, before, before we all go, selfishly this is this is not particularly work oriented um i suspect in around up to christmas everybody's sort of diaries are coming out and sort of doing things left right and center but i wondered if perhaps in the new year um there might be some appetite to to go out um have a meal a drink just just oh, yeah. as a forum um i'm not i say I'm not, I'm not gonna suggest it before christmas because i suspect everybody's um overrun a little bit um i do i think three quarters of my year socializing in about three weeks uh sort of billion no mates for most of the year and suddenly sort of <laughs> i mean <laughs> you mean you mean what you mean chris is in the words of my son we should meet irl oh <laughs> all right <laughs> Chris, well, we'll Chris, try and, that, we'll try Chris, and fill a, your January a, diary, Chris. That, that was that was a shameful attempt for us to make for, to, to to make us feel sorry for you. Well, you know, uh, it's probably truthful. <laughs> I think it's a really sterling idea, and maybe you know, depending on everybody's commitment, we could sort of do it either every alternate meeting that we have. You know, the round table could be in person if everybody is in agreement with that. Yeah, I, I, I don't even think uh, it was it was just an idea. It doesn't even have to be, um, you know. You can uh, invite us all to your lovely boardroom, Chris. Yeah, well, yeah. very happy to do that. Very happy to do that. I thought people, rather than have sort of nipples and a drink, might prefer to actually go out and do something a little bit more su substantial. But yeah, I'm, always, I'm always happy not to go very far, which is why I, I suffer from the, <laughs> the empty diary. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. no, let's let's definitely catch um yeah we plan about something out you know out and maybe january we can definitely meet in person okay that maybe would be great a twice a year affair or something to meet in yeah. person at the round table would be lovely maybe every alternate time might be difficult twice a year would be good i think yeah i think Isn't twice it? a year works, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay yeah, that sounds like a fantastic idea thank you for that chris you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> Chris, out of that, you've got twice a year with uh, drinks and nibbles. I've, <laughs> I've, just, I've, just, I've just doubled my social calendar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll probably have oh, to go and lie down now. <laughs> I was going to say, you'll have to wait till you see if anyone turns up. It might just be you on a night well, out on your I own. Still, I, I still regard that as success. That's me going out. <laughs> 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 On that happy note, have a lovely rest of the week and uh, see you around. Is anybody here coming to the Christmas lunch at yes, all? Yes, I am. I am. Oh, lovely. So, Ross, yeah. see you there. And Genevieve, yeah. Chris, you aren't there. No, you missed an opportunity. Uh, yes, I, it, I'm afraid it did actually clash with something at the risk of uh, letting myself down. Yes, it did. So, uh, <laughs> <Who> are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sandia. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks very Thank much, you. guys. Okay. See Thank you there. Bye. 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 Bye.